All right, so first here, I, I called this wolves among sheep. I'm not sure what it, but identifying the wolves from the Word of God. And we're going to go through and look at some things here tonight. So turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, please, if you would. Matthew chapter 7, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move as quickly and efficiently as I possibly can here through this. I don't know how long this is going to take. I'm not sure, so, but we got started on time, so that's good. We'll, we'll just keep even later since we did that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but verse number 15 says this, beware of false prophets. So identifies these false prophets as wolves. They are wolves, and you have to look out for the wolves. He said, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight, what that means exactly. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. We're going to explain what is a ravening wolf. So the Bible tells us that they're ravening wolves. We'll get into that. Okay, now turn to Matthew chapter 10, verse number 16. We're going to go through a lot of these verses here kind of tonight and give you some concepts and some ideas here to get you in the right mindset here to understand what exactly is the Lord trying to tell us here about wolves. Why does he compare, you know, the characteristics of a wolf to these false prophets? And it's pretty fascinating when you start to look at it in depth, you see some things that the Lord wants to show you. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse number 16. Matthew chapter 10, verse number 16. Behold... I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. So he says, he likes, he says, behold, I send you forth as sheep. You are sheep and you are in the midst of wolves. I'm going to explain to you who those wolves are that he's talking about exactly. And they are present day today, and they have been around for a very long time. Be therefore wise as serpents. Now, we're going to talk about the serpent sometimes, sometime in the future. We've talked about serpents before. We've met a few. And, and we'll, but we're going to go through serpents, and we're going to talk about that. I'm going to do one of these on serpents. And we're going to see what the Bible says about serpents. And I'm going to show you that from the Word of God and show you in illustrations about serpents. I'm going to call this series like Bible Animals or something. I haven't, I haven't determined what I'm going to call it yet, but, but I'm going to show you some of that. And we're going to go through some of those different things like this and kind of do some comparisons here uh, on other, at other times when the Lord leads. Okay, so he says to be wise as serpents. We've talked about what that means, but we'll put that all into perspective because that's just one aspect of a serpent. They're very wise. You know, and, and what that means exactly. All right, but he says, I send you in the midst. He said, be wise. He said, be wise of the wolves. He's telling them, you know, you be like a serpent. You be very wise when you're among those wolves. He's warning them what their behavior ought to be. The Bible tells us, we just talked about, it tells us that the wolves are ravening. We're going to talk about that. What does that mean? Ravening wolves. Ezekiel, turn to Ezekiel chapter 22. Talks about that. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse number 27, I believe. Is that what I have there? Yeah. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey. Mm. To shed blood and to destroy souls. To get dishonest gain. So there's a hint what wolves do. Did you see that? There's a hint for you there. Pay attention. Pay attention to what's being said there. It says her princes in the midst Thereof are like wolves. Well, what do wolves do? It says, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. That's a good description. You're going to see how that, that description right there is, is consistent all the way through the Bible. This is a, so when you see wolves in the Bible, this is what you see. Do You see how that works, how God does that all the way through the Scriptures? You're going to see the same thing. You're going to see the same characteristics. You're going to see what wolves do and why they're likened to false prophets, right? You're going to see that, all right? All right, let's move on here. The Bible tells us they are grievous. Turn to Acts chapter 20. And I'll break all these down. We'll go through and show you a bunch of different things, but I'm going to just go through some scriptures with you here right away, go through these points here right away. Then we'll kind of fly through some of these pictures. Acts chapter 20. Verse number 29, I believe. Let's see if I got that right. I think I do. My pages are sticking together. There we go. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Bible says they are grievous wolves. Mm. 
We're going to talk about that, all right? The Bible tells us they will not spare the flock. Look at this. It says, it says they will enter in among you, that after my departing, says right now, Paul says, I got the rod out, and I whack them when I see them, and they don't come around me. They stay away from me. They don't like to face you. They don't, see, they don't like to face the shepherd. That makes sense, doesn't it? I guess you've seen that a few times, don't, haven't you? Yeah. That's right. He's got the word of God. He's got the rod. They don't want to face him. Why? Because they work for the devil. So they can't face you. Makes sense, doesn't it? Makes a little too much sense when you live it, doesn't it? For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They will not spare anything. We'll talk about that. They... They will destroy, right? The Bible says that these wolves, we talked about that, these wolves will destroy. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse number 27. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse number 8, says that they are fierce. And we'll, we'll we'll get to that verse here in a little while, so that's why I'm not going there now. But Habakkuk chapter 1, verse number 8, the Bible says they are fierce. Wolves are very fierce predators. We're going to talk about some of their some of their attributes, some of their characteristics, and how they liken to false prophets. It's amazing. I think you're going to see some pretty interesting things. The Bible says, turn to Matthew chapter 7. Look what the Word of God says to us about wolves. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 16 again. If I can get there, my pages keep sticking together. It's a new Bible, Joshua. I guess pages are sticking together. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. So you study their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Amen? So the Bible is very clear. So this is just a few things that the Bible says about wolves. Now, it says here, beware of wolves. It says, look at that picture there. I want you to think about that for a second. That wolf ripped the leg off of that deer, probably. That's probably what that is, Lee. Ripped the leg off of that and took off with it. He's got it in his mouth, and he's taken off with it. It says, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. That's a picture of a ravening wolf, sort of. I'll get to some more. But pretty descriptive, huh? Pretty... Make sense to you? You kids going to have nightmares about it? Hopefully. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm kidding. That word ravening, what does it mean? It means praying, praying, not P-R-A-Y. P-R-E-Y. Pray. It's their prey. Ferociously. Devouring as a ravening wolf. Eagerness for plunder. They just want to destroy. Do you understand that? They want to destroy. It's all they want to do. They seek to devour and destroy their prey. They will not spare the flock or anyone else to get what they desire. Right? They will not. They have an eagerness to, to destroy. That's what a wolf does. That's what ravening means. Ezekiel twenty two twenty seven 27 says, Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood. And to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. So they do it by dishonest gain. Okay, they're not honest in what they do. So they do, they do it, dis- wolves act dishonestly. They're very sneaky. Yeah. You know, one thing, yeah, they steal. That's right. That's what they do. We're going to talk about that. They come in to steal. That's what wolves do. They steal sheep. Uh-oh. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what they do. They come in and they take them away. They do other things, too. We'll talk about that. But I want you to notice this. It says, to shed blood, to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. 
We're going to talk about that, what that means exactly, how they do that exactly. But they, they care not whether they shed blood. You know, it's interesting. Wolves are very sneaky. And we'll talk about this. I think I might have put this in there, but if I didn't, one of the things that wolves do when they hunt their prey in the cold in Minnesota here, they will actually put snow inside of their mouth and up to their mouth. They will put snow. And the reason they do that is so their prey cannot see the, the, the breath coming out of them. They know to do that. Uh-huh. They're very sneaky. Right? Yeah. Pretty amazing, huh? That's what wolves do. That's why the Bible likens false prophets to wolves. You know, here's the thing that always baffles me that people think. They think for some reason that, well, listen, I mean, they didn't say they were antichrist. <laughs> right? They didn't say they were antichrist. They sang, Jesus loves me. Yeah. They prayed the prayer, right? Wolves, they're like Satan. You notice that verse, what it said, it says they come to devour. That's what they do. They're like Satan, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's what they're out after. They're out to devour and destroy. They are on a mission to destroy. Now, Look at this nice little little lamb there. Isn't that great? I wish people would not see this when they look at Joel Olstein. But they do. I wish, I wish they would see this. That's what I wish you would see. Do you understand? Because that's Joel Olstein. That's Billy Graham. Do you understand? Was. Sorry. Right. That's Franklin Graham, which we're going to talk about tonight. That's Benny Hinn. That's Creflo Dollar, right? What's that one guy with, like, enough devils for all of them put together? Kenneth Copeland. That's Kenneth Copeland, right? Joyce Meyer, right there. That's what you think they look like, not you, but many people think they look like that little lamb. No. That's what they are, right? That's what they are. Paul said, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Remember that picture you just saw? Well, that's what they look like to God. To you and I, they, they don't seem that way, and that's why they deceive us. Because the Bible says that they lie in wait to deceive. You and I can't imagine that people would actually do that. That would name the name of Christ. Honestly, myself, I never thought that there would be people. I thought, here's what I thought in my life. When I got called to preach, and I, and I answered the call to preach, and I served God and preached and everything, I could not imagine that there would be somebody that would come along that wouldn't take this seriously, that really wasn't here for honest intentions. It, it never dawned on me that there would be people that would do that. Right. It never dawned on me that there would be, I never thought that even though the Word of God said it, for me personally, I never thought there'd be people that would just be wolves like that, that would come to destroy, that Satan would send in to destroy. Mm -hmm. Never thought it. Never thought it at all. But there are. And they are. You know, the Bible shows us that the end times are marked with these infiltrators and wolves. As we get closer to the end times, what the Bible tells us, as we are in the end times, as we get closer to the end, what the Bible tells us is that evil men and seducers shall what? Wax worse and worse. Deceived and being deceived. I think some of them don't even know what they are. Some of them don't. But many of them, when they're confronted with the truth, they run. They run. When the light shines, see, wolves don't like the light. They love darkness rather than light. 
That's why you'll see they do most of their damage at night. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse number 3. Sorry I put that extra 3 in there, but hey, I did the best I could. (laughs) What do you think of my picture, though? Isn't that great? Ooh, it's kind of gross, isn't it? Zephaniah chapter 3, verse number 3. I won't make you try to find that because some of you won't, don't even know that's in the Bible yet, but you'll figure it out here in a few minutes. Her princes with her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. What in the world does that mean? means there ain't nothing left. They lick it all up and destroy and devour everything in their path. And if you don't get the wolf away from the flock, they'll destroy all of it. Yep. They devour the flesh in the night, says Adam Clark, and gnaw the bones and extract the marrow afterwards. They use all violence and predatory oppression. Like wild beast, they shun the light and turn day into night by their revelings. Adam Clark. You know, Lee, I don't know if that was a wolf that you, that, 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 that deer that was left out there overnight and he came back the next day, the next morning, and it was completely devoured. It was devoured. Because that's what wolves do. They devour. John Gill says that not having gnawn any bones in the morning or eaten anything that day, hence they are so greedy in the evening, and so is the last clause given a reason why evening wolves are so ferocious for which such cruel judges and are compared to them. He says that they they completely they don't eat all day and then they wait for night. So they devise mischief on their beds, which we're going to talk about in the night. They can't sleep at night because they're Conjuring up evil. That's what they're doing. They're plotting evil. They're planning to destroy. That's what they do. And this is exactly what false prophets and wolves do who preach damnable heresies. They will do it, do to, they'll do it to any believer who, who fellowships with them and accepts their teachings. This is how God sees false prophets. See that? That's what he says they're like. Right there. You think about that for a second. Just look at that picture for a second and think about that. Because, you know, you and I, we, they, I, I've met people that, that when they're people that preach damnable heresies, that they treat them like they're that little lamb. But they're not. They're that. No matter if they come in sheep's clothing... We'll get to that. Wherefore, a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evenings shall spoil them. Jeremiah 5, 6. It says a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evenings shall spoil They spoil it, destroy it, done with it. That's what they do. That's how they act. Micah chapter 2, verse number 1 says this, Woe to them that devise iniquity. And work evil upon their beds. This is when they do this is at night. They sit up all night long thinking about devising, they devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When morning is light, they practice it. Because it is in the power of their hand. So they've plotted and planned it. They've evil surmised about it. They've sat up all night and talked about it. They've devised it in their mind, and they've planned it. They've watched their prey very carefully. I've had people say, oh, yeah, I, I, I watched you for a year or two before I came here. Without contacting me. Just watch me. Now, hirelings, they will not warn the sheep 
about the wolves. Shepherds, and we're going to talk about shepherds sometime, but shepherds are to protect the flock from wolves and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. I couldn't resist. <laughs> this is kind of like a, a picture of David in some ways. You know, guard, here, here's a bear on one side, a lion on the other side, or a tiger on the other side, right? Coming after him, a lion on the other side, coming after him, right? Coming after the flock to get to the sheep, and he's standing as the door to those sheep, right? And we'll talk about that. John chapter 10 in your Bibles, please. John chapter 10 and verse number 11. I am the good shepherd. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. Amen. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep. Those men that leave the flock so easily are never fit to lead the flock. I'm going to say it again. Those men who leave the flock so easily are not fit to lead the flock. No matter how called they believe they are or they deceive someone into believing they are. No, that's a hireling. Right? Can you guys see over here okay? Can you see past? Okay. Um, it says here, it says here, they see the wolf coming and leave it the sheep and fleeth. They run. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he's a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I've seen pastors desert their flocks for bigger and bigger callings. Right? Some bigger church, man, they're gone. Don't have a man in place, they just leave. Just take off. Somebody else offered them a bigger church, man, they're gone. Right? I've seen pastors sit down and negotiate their salary before they come to a church. One guy said, I remember one guy, he would not come to that church they said they were going to give him like $2,000 or something, $2,500 in salary. He needed like 3000 For 500 bucks. he said he wasn't going to come. Right? Oh, I'm sure you have heard worse, yeah. Yeah. There are two things wolves primarily do. I want to show you this. Wolves catch the sheep. See this? He got him. He found one off by himself, and he got him. See that? That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to snatch them, right? He snatches them to devour them. That's what he wants to do. He wants to do that to anybody that's out roaming around. Not to, That's why you've got to be careful. There's a lot of wolves on the Internet. You don't know their manner of life and how they live and if they walk with God and if they're separated unto holiness with God. You have no idea what they're living and what they're doing. You better be careful who you listen to. Better be careful. I'm not telling you not to listen to anybody. I'm telling you to be careful. Just like Jesus did. Beware. He said, beware of wolves. Right? Right? Wolves catch the sheep. That's one thing they do. They get some of the sheep, don't they? Remember, he snatches them to devour them, just like Satan seeks to isolate God's people to devour and destroy them. Right? That's his goal. He wants to devour and to destroy them. And that is the wolf's only goal, to catch them and consume them. Like that right there. He'll rip that thing to shreds. He'll eat it. Right? Because that's what wolves do. That's how dangerous they are. Wolves also scatter the sheep. If they cannot devour God's sheep, then they scatter them. Right? 
They'll discourage them to get them away from the flock. They'll lie in wait to deceive them. They'll enter into a flock and scare them with paranoia and nonsense. Right? With a bunch of paranoia and nonsense to spook the sheep. You know how easy it is to spook a sheep? We're going to talk about sheep. But it's real easy to spook them. They're not exactly built with grenade launchers and glocks or anything like that. They're, they're, I mean, they have the Word of God, but they depend on the shepherd more. I mean, not than the Word of God, but they depend on the shepherd other than themselves. You know, number one, they depend on God's Word. Number two, though, they need the church. They need to be flocked up. It's the importance of being flocked up. And if they don't know the Word of God, if they're young sheep, then they have to be taught the Word of God. And they can be deceived rather easily. Just like babies can be deceived very easily. Babies will put anything in their mouth and eat it. If you let them, right? They'll put anything in their mouth. Right? They will. If they can't devour God's sheep, then they will scatter them. They will discourage them. They'll get them away from the flock. Get them away from the shepherd. That's what they want. You know, wolves will come in and try to build They'll come in sheep's clothing. They'll come into a church, and they'll try to build a following after them to separate that sheep from the shepherd. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And listen, sheep are not long-distance runners. (laughs) They're not exactly built for a marathon. (laughs) Their race is slow and steady with patience. We run the race which is set before us. But we're sheep, right? And sheep don't run that fast. And they don't run that long. They're safer when they're flocked up. Right? Yep, they move as a group. That's right. And they're safer that way. Right? They depend on the shepherd for protection from predators. Right? That's how God made it, right? Now, Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd, but if there's a chief shepherd, then there must needs be under shepherds, right? That's how God intended it to be. When they are away from the shepherd and the flock, they, get, they run the risk of being devoured. It happens. So what does nature tell us about the wolves? You may not be able to read this, but I'll read it to you. The wolf is rather larger than than our largest dogs and looks somewhat like them. But he seems more wild, savage, and cruel. The wolves go in large companies making a terrible howling noise. And though they they are in general cowardly... I've seen some of them... Yet when they are very hungry, they attack large animals and even men. They almost go out by night. They almost always go out by night, and the Bible refers to them when it says their horses are more fierce than the evening wolves. Jacob, just before his death, said of one of his sons, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf in the morning. He shall devour the prey, and at evening he shall divide the spoil. A ferocious wild animal, the Canis lupus, belonging to the dog genus, indeed, it closely resembles the dog, and it is only by a few slight differences of shape that they are distinguished. Wolves never bark, but only howl. They are cruel, but cowardly animals. They fly from man. See, they seek to, wolves seek to pick off the sheep, but they won't face the shepherd. Except when impelled by hunger, in which case they prowl by night in great droves through villages and destroy any persons they meet. They are swift of foot, strong enough to carry off a sheep at full speed and an an overmatch for ordinary dogs. In severe winters, wolves assemble in large troops, join in dreadful howlings, and make terrible devastation. They are the peculiar objects of terror to shepherds. As the defenselessness, and timidity, and the timidness of the sheep render it an easy prey to wolves. 
That's why sometimes they say, well, Pastor Cooley, you're too hard on things. You're too straightforward on things. You're too mean about some things. Maybe that's because I see that wolf. And I understand what they look like. And I don't see the same thing you do. I see it a little bit differently. And the dangers that can arise when a shepherd doesn't have his eye on things. A distracted shepherd is a very dangerous thing for a flock. That's why I'm trying to be very careful that I don't get myself distracted into any other things, trying to make extra money and things that I have to do sometimes and things like that, that I'm very careful that I don't get too distracted because I know what the Lord wants me to do. Amen? That's important. Wolves love the night. They love to be ravenous at night. So it is with spiritual wolves. They love to do what they do at night to devour the saints of God. They do it in the dark. They plot and plan and pray at night. The wolves will track their prey using only their sense of smell. Once they close to the, they, once they are close to their prey, they will start to become more discreet. During the winter, wolves have been seen to hold snow in their mouths when they are close to their prey. This helps them to avoid detection by lowering the temperature in their mouths so that their breath is not visible. By the way, did you know that wolves can smell their prey 1.75 miles away? And so can false prophets. They hunt for the innocent blood. And they can smell it. They can see a mark. They can see somebody. They can see and they prey on them. A technique of hunting is intimidation. Wolves single out their prey such as a bison and try to get it to run. There is less danger from hooves and horns that way. If the animal is old, sick, or very young, wolves will dash in for the kill right away. If the animal is healthy, wolves can deny their quarry food, water, rest, and herd security for up to two weeks. The wolves wound the animal by snapping at it from time to time, and eventually the prey will collapse with loss from loss of blood and exhaustion. You mean wolves? Yeah, they try to wear you down. Like the Antichrist wearing out the saints of the Most High, make them tired and wear them down, and then they come in for the kill. Mm -hmm. That is a picture of wolves in sheep's clothing. Right? I don't have any pictures of Little Red Riding Hood. But there's the wolf, the big bad wolf right there. But, you know, that's what the Bible says. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. And that's what the Bible is trying to tell you right there. That's what God's Word is telling you. This is what they are. You see that lovely little lamb, but that's what God says they are. That's what God says about heresy and false prophets. That's what he says about them. That's who they are. That's who wolves are right there. Well, why sheep's clothing? That's a good picture, isn't it? I didn't make any of these pictures. I found them on the Internet. <laughs> I did. I didn't make any of these. I'm not good enough to do that. I just went searching for them. <laughs> oh, anyway. But they're good pictures. Why sheep's clothing, though? The sheep is an emblem of innocence, sincerity, and harmlessness. They come to you in sheep's clothing, these wolves. They come with sincerity and looking innocent. Harmless. I mean, look, if a little sheep comes up to you and licks your hand, the last thing you're thinking is, well, this thing's a ferocious wolf that's going to bite my fingers off, right? That's the last thing you're thinking. Right? To come in sheep's clothing is to assume sanctity and innocence 
when the heart is evil, says Adam Clark. When their heart is fixed on evil and they're inwardly they are ravening wolves, that's why they come in sheep's clothing. They assume a purity, a sanctity, an innocence. They come like a meek, they come like a meek and sometimes quiet spirit that they mimic or copy from truly meek and God-fearing people. It is a wolfish humility. That. Uh-huh. It's a wolfish humility. They get on and they do video, oh, I'm a humble servant. Well, why do you got to tell anybody? Why do you got to tell somebody you're a humble servant? Why don't you just be humble? Oh, I know. Because you're not humble and you want to tell people you're humble. Right? <laughs> I'm just a, a meek and lowly servant. I'm just a meek and I'm just a humble servant. First of all, I'm a humble servant. Well, then why did you just tell us you're a humble servant? Isn't that being proud? Think about that. I just want you to know how humble I am. I should have a t-shirt on right now that says, I'm more humble than you. I'm the humblest of all. I'm the humble later. <laughs> right? <laughs> if I, there's a superhero, I'd be humble, man. <laughs> right? <laughs> Without the tights. <laughs> Please. No tights. <laughs> all right? But <laughs> you get the point, right? It's a wolfish humility. It's not real. Truly humble people don't have to tell anyone they're humble, but they obey the truth. They are humble before God and bold before men. And they don't apologize no matter how many times people want them to for being bold. <sighs> Next. The scribes and the Pharisees were wolves. Mark chapter 12, please, in your Bible. Mark chapter 12, verse number 38. Yes, that is a picture of Bill Schneblin. And yes, I am calling him a Pharisee, and I'm calling him a wolf. Because he is leading people back to the Old Testament law. Not to mention a lot of other creepy things. And I think he might still be a witch. So anyway, Mark chapter 12, verse number 38, and he said unto them, in his doctrine, beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing. There you go. And love salutations in the marketplace and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. Look, if you pray longer before men than you do before home, in the privacy of your own home, you better get that right with God. You better be seeking God's face. Way, you better be praying way more in private than you do in public. Amen. God knows. Matthew chapter 23, verse number 5, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. The Pope is a wolf. Yeah, he is. What, what does that mean, though? Why do, you say the, why do I say that that's, that's what they are? Well, it says wolves in sheep's clothing, right? Well, that's what they're talking about, the wool. Long wool robes. That they wore. Jesus said, yeah, those scribes and Pharisees, yeah, they're a bunch of wolves. Those Hebrew roots people, yeah, they're a bunch of wolves. <laughs> In a garment which reached to the feet and was made of wool of sheep, the Babylonian garment Achan saw and stole was a garment called a melotes, which is the very Greek word the author of the epistle to the Hebrews uses for sheepskins. Persecuted saints wandered about in, Right? And the gloss upon the place in the talith, a garment of pure wool. It was the way of deceivers and profane men to cover themselves with 
their talith or long garment, as if they were righteous men, that persons might receive their lies. All which agrees very well with the Pharisees, who would have been thought to have been holy and righteous, humble, modest, and self-denying men, when they were inwardly full of hypocrisy and iniquity, of rapine, oppression, and covetousness, and under a pretense of religion, devoured widows' houses. That's how Rome made all their money. Though it seems by what follows that Christ has respect at least also to such who bore his name and came in his name, though not sent by him and called him Lord and prophesied and cast out devils and did many wonderful works in his name, that they might get the good will and affections of the people, clothe themselves not in garments made of sheep's wool, but in the very skins of sheep with the wool on them in imitation of the true prophets and the good men of old pretending great humility and self-denial, and so wore a rough garment to deceive. When they were inwardly greedy dogs, grievous wolves of insatiable covetousness, and when opportunity offered, spared not the flock to satisfy their rapacious and devouring appetites. And the Jews speak of that wolfish humility, like that of a wolf in the fable which put a sheepskin. There are some men who appear to be humble and fear God in a deceitful and hypocritical way, but inwardly, Lay wait. This humility our wise men call wolfish humility, such as this our Lord inveighs against and bids his followers beware of. Amen. That guy right there is the king of the wolves right there. He's the head of the pack. He is a big devil. But people just see some nice old man, and I see a dirty old pervert that would, if he could, cut my head off. Billy Graham and Schuler were wolves. Billy said on Schuler's program that Muslims and all others could be saved not even knowing the name of Jesus. Schuler said, There's a wideness in God's mercy. A wideness, Billy. I'm so glad to hear you say that. Notice the long robe. <laughs> right? Oh, Schuler and Billy. What's that? I didn't hear you. Oh, the handshake. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Bunch of devils. Graham was probably the most dangerous wolf for the, past, for the last 50 years. He sent Catholics from his crusades back to Roman Catholic churches. Promising he would not try to convert them from Roman Catholic doctrine. Catholic bishops and rabbis supported Graham's crusades. The Bishop of New York supported his crusades. In fact, the Bishop of New York said, hey, it's okay if you, uh, Billy's last crusade that he did, he said, hey, it's okay if you go to Billy's crusade, fill it up, man. Billy's not going to try to recruit anybody. We like the way he evangelizes. They even wrote a letter of, con of, of not condemnation, of commendation. How about that? So he had rabbis, and the rabbis went to the meetings and said, hey, man, this is great. Nobody's going to convert you from Judaism. Well, that's true because Billy's gospel doesn't change anybody, so that's, of course, it wouldn't happen. He's telling the truth. His one, two, three, repeat after me nonsense that he preached. He was a wolf that spoke some truth, but he inwardly was a ravening wolf. The Bible tells us to examine the fruit. Let's look at this. Let's think about this for a second. False prophets like Billy Graham lead men back to the same apostate churches they were a part of. How is that a gospel? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Hey, is Glenn Beck your brother in Christ? Glenn Beck is a professing uh, Mormon. Is he your brother in Christ? Billy Graham said he was. Said he was his brother, and I said, I know he is your brother. You devil. He's not mine. That's not very nice. I know it's not very nice for wolfish wolves like that to do that to the flock of God. It's not very nice for them to do that. It's very nice for me to tell you he's doing it, though. That's extremely nice. That's what God told me to do. Amen. Wolves are greedy. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. You know, shepherds that don't have a problem with wolves, they'll let them be in their flock, and they won't do anything about it because the money keeps flowing in. Let 
But when the shepherd takes a rod and smacks them out of the house, people get mad. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. Right? Ill-gotten gain, greedy for gain. Right? Wolves are greedy of filthy lucre. They will do nothing that costs them to lose any money or their image. Now, let's talk about this for a second. Billy Graham's net worth when he died was $25 million. $25 million. I would say the Pope paid him very well for what he did. And so did Satan. But not now. He's burning in hell. But think about that for a second. Wait a minute now. This guy is supposed to be America's pastor, and I said this on my Facebook page, and I'll say it here for you live. Listen, if Billy Graham is America's pastor, then that's the reason why America is so apostate. End quote. He's worth 25, he was worth $25 million. And, and everybody's lauding this, man. Why are presidents, why are Catholic Catholic senators and congressmen lauding this man and say, well, yeah, we need Billy Day, Billy Goat Graham Day. Let's let him lie in state. Why? Why? Why are Roman Catholics doing that? I'll tell you why. Because he's a son of Rome, that's why. He's a son of a whore. The Roman Catholic whore. Is that too straight? I can make it straighter. So straight it'll cut you when you slide down it. Franklin Graham draws a salary between, between his two nonprofit organizations of $880,000 a year. $880,000 a year. Almost a million dollars a year running the Good Samaritan Purse or whatever that is and the Billy Graham Association. He almost rakes in a million dollars a year in a nonprofit organization. Look, somebody's making some profit. I hate to break it to you, pal, but somebody's making some profit, and it is Billy and his boy, Frankie. I mean, look, if I was lost, I'd be like fist bumping him, like, high five, dude, man, you are rolling. I need to get me one of them nonprofits, man. Oh, I'm telling you, if I wasn't saved, I could do it, man. I could get me a nonprofit. I could run like 10 thrift stores, nonprofit, and pay myself like 100 grand a year, at least, easily. I'm just telling you. I, 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 look, I watched the scam. I went to one of these thrift stores, and I started talking to that guy, and he was telling me everything. I'm like, dude, for real, you all running a business. This is a business. You got this nonprofit charity work and you are making bank. You are rolling. And that's when they had meetings like with Benny Hinn and all that. They, I walked into that thrift store and they were like, hey, do you guys do Benny Hinn? I'm like, nah. Nah, I don't do drugs. <laughs> I got saved from that stuff. Need any of that, right? It was kind of funny, Lee. No, I'm, just, no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just said it was kind of funny because somebody laughed over there. I was like, well, it was kind of funny. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. Anyway, so 800, I'm still thinking about 800. Oh, how about this? The Billy Graham Association is worth over $125 million. Man, Billy needs a day named after him. Better believe he does. He should have been in Donald Trump's administration. That guy's a genius. That wolf made a fortune off of the flocks. Right? Man, he, didn't just, he wasn't just a wolf in sheep's clothing. He ripped the whole sheep off and put it on himself and wore it. He walked around in the costume, and he's like, no, I got real sheep wool on, man. See its head? Got him. Come on. Let me ask you a question. 
when's the next time you think a president or a senator or a congressman or anybody's going to call me up and say, hey, man, come preach for me? Any of them. Any of them do that. I won't. Right? Could you imagine? But Billy got rich doing it. Well, he was the guide to so many presidents. Yeah, look how bad our country is, too. Man, what a terrible guide. Right? Working for the Pope, right? I know I want to say it, but I'm not going <laughs> to. But the Bible says they lie and wait to deceive. You know, this is, this is us, all right? We're these lambs. And they, they lie and wait to deceive. That's what these false prophets do. That's how dangerous they are. Romans chapter 16, verse number 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And look at this. Are you paying attention to this last part? And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. Good words and fair speeches. Right? But that's not exactly how they live, is it? It isn't. It isn't how they live. Right? They, they become rich. They get ill-gotten gain. They creep in. They crep in unawares, right? And they take over. And they destroy the flock. So the Bible says to beware of them. Beware of wolves. Right? Who come to you in sheep's clothing. So I hope it gives you a little bit of a better idea here tonight. I mean, I'm getting you out early, man. How long was this? Like 45 minutes? Man, that's awesome. Do I get a bonus for that or something, man? I get a thumbs up? Thanks, brother. Yeah, $880,000 nonprofit a year bonus? No. Anyway, but it's interesting. It is interesting, though, when you, when you take a look at it, just what wolves are like in the Bible. So we're going to continue this series on uh, uh, in the weeks to come. I don't know how often I'll do it, but I want to do one on sheep. I want to do one on the shepherds and just and the serpents. I want to talk about serpents, too. That'll be an interesting one. But anyway, so, you know, the Bible warns us to beware, to mark them. We live in a day and age, though, that nobody wants to mark them. Oh, I've had so many people get mad at me, and not one of them look at the evidence about Billy Graham. His own words. Oh, I know he said a few things in interviews. No, it's not just interviews. It's not just interviews. It's the fact that he went to see the Pope Somebody said, yeah, he preached the gospel to the Pope. That's a long ways to go to preach the gospel to the Pope. I mean, you could have called him. <laughs> but the Pope knows the gospel, okay? He just does He disobeys the gospel. He rejects it. No, he didn't go to preach to the Pope. He said that he likes the Pope, and he said they agree on lots of things. That's what he said. We agree on lots of things. And I like him very much. That's what he said. I don't like the Pope. Right? I could make a rhyme up like green eggs and ham how much I don't like the Pope. I won't do it right now, but I could. I might do that. <laughs> and put it to a PowerPoint. That'd be great. But I'm serious. I don't like the Pope. <laughs> See, it's going, it's like the wheels are turning right now, and it's like I can think of them, like they're coming, like it's coming, like I, I can, it's like poetry, it just, look, don't hate on Dr. Seuss, there's some funny stuff about Dr. Seuss anyway, it's comedy, anyway, but, you know, he sided with the Pope very easily, I mean, and, so, and the Pope supported his meetings. I find it very interesting that this Pope has been very silent, he didn't say anything about this, the passing of Billy Graham or anything. And that's just to, for the deceit to grow even more. Because Billy Graham is going to be more dangerous in his death than he was in his life. Because they are going to, like, lift him up. 
like you would not believe. And I see Baptist pastors already whitewashing things that he said and did. I'm like, you guys preached against him, some of you did. And now you're like, oh, I thank God for Billy Graham. And, and, and they're just like, yeah. And they're, they're like, for everything that he did and blah, blah, blah. I said, like, what, like, like siding with Rome? Like sending people back to Roman Catholic churches? Like saying that there's more that there's that Muslims can be saved without knowing the name of Jesus, like all those things, and more and more and more and more things. But see, nobody wants to call out the wolves today. And if you do call them out, you're gonna get attacked. You're gonna get attacked because they don't want to do that today. It's not comfortable. America is full of that of wolves, you know. And if you call them out. They're going to come after you. That's just the way it goes. Anyway, but uh, good, good, easy lesson tonight here for us to think about and just some things to reflect on. Amen. Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness. We pray, Lord, that you would just help us, Lord, to be aware of wolves, that they come in sheep's clothing, Lord. They come to destroy. And, Lord, help us. Help us to be vigilant, to be sober. For our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Dear God, these come from their father, Satan. They come from the Antichrist spirit, and they come to devour. Lord, please protect our churches, protect this flock. Help us, Lord, to strengthen one another in these coming days. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.